Hi, this video is about solutions and solution chemistry. It's basically going to cover the basic concepts, what solutions are and why they're studied. So the reason why they're so well studied is in labs, we tend to use a lot of solutions for reactions. Although solutions tend to be liquid based, the general definition allows for other types of solutions as well. Most people think just like the picture, a solution is a salt or a solid dissolved in water. Solutions have two components. They have what is referred to as a solute and the solvent. The solute is always what's being dissolved. So that's one definition. The solvent is typically the dissolving medium. I like the quantitative aspects and the quantitative definitions for solute and solvent, where we say that the solute is the lesser amount and the solvent is the greater amount. That makes it a lot easier. That way, when we look at salt being dissolved in water, we see that it is obviously the solute because there's less of it. Solutions, which have solute and solvent, are also homogeneous mixtures. That basically means that they're uniform throughout. Solutions can also consist of more than just one type of solute, as we'll see in the upcoming examples. So as discussed earlier, we could have solutions where there are not just liquids and solids. There can also be gases. One example of a solution is air. Air is both gas for its solute and gas in its solvent. The majority of air, about 79%, is nitrogen gas. So because that's the largest component of the solution, nitrogen would be considered the solvent. One solute, because there can be more than one, is nitrogen. That's about 19%. So that's why it's considered the primary solute in air. Air is a homogeneous mixture. It's clear and uniform throughout. It's not like you can actually see in the corner the oxygen molecules or the water vapor or other trace gases. Liquids can be solutions as well. One example of a gas in a liquid is soda. Carbon dioxide, the gas in the, in, in the solution, would be considered the solute because it's a lesser amount. You could have liquid and liquid solutions. Another example, one here is vinegar. Another example would be alcohol. Whenever you see 80 proof, that basically means 40% alcohol. So 40% ethanol out of the 100% total. You could have solids and liquid. So we, also sh we already showed salt water. And we can also have solid solutions, which a lot of people don't realize. So one example of a salt solution is an alloy such as a brass, or an amalgam. So what I want to make sure is you can identify when you see an example of a solution, which component is the solute, remember the lesser amount, and which component is the solvent, the greater amount. So if we look at number A, we have two grams of sugar and 100 milliliters of water. So which one would be the solute? The sugar it's in the lesser amount. In number B, there's 60 mils of ethyl alcohol and 30 mils of methyl alcohol combined. Which one would be the solute? Well, 30 is less than 60, so the methyl alcohol. C, 55 milliliters of water or 1.50 grams of sodium chloride the 1.5 grams of sodium chloride. For those of you who aren't sure why, water has a density of one gram per one milliliter. If I have 55 milliliters of water, that means that I basically have 55 grams. And 55 grams is a greater amount than the 1.5 we see here. Okay, now to part D. Air is 200 milliliters of oxygen, 800 milliliters of nitrogen. So we kind of already talked about this where I said it was roughly 79% nitrogen, 
19% oxygen. So we see that the solute would be the smaller amount oxygen. So what is the nature of solutes and solutions? Basically, when you throw a solute in a solvent, it tends to spread out. It's kind of a diffusion within the medium. So we can see kind of a dilution of the color. So in this example, we have copper II sulfate, which is known for being once dissolved a bluish solution because the copper two ion, so this would represent the copper two plus ion, gives a blue color. And we can see that it's concentrated at first, but as it spreads out through the solution, it becomes an even color or uniform throughout. Again, that's why solutions are considered homogeneous mixtures. They can't be separated by filtration. The solute particles, in this case, the copper two ions and the sulfate ions, are too small. They would go right through the pores of that filter. However, they can be separated by evaporation or another term, distillation. Here we take advantage of the solvent and the solute's different physical properties. The solute, the copper two sulfate, which is an ionic compound, has a much higher boiling point than water, the solvent. You could easily boil off the water and separate it from the solute that's dissolved in it. Another thing that has already been discussed is although the solute can't be visible, it can give off a color in the solution, as in the case of this copper two plus solution. Now the reason why people typically think of solutions as being liquid based is water is the most common solvent. It's extremely abundant in nature and it's easily used to dissolve many things. The reason why water is so good at dissolving so many things or such a good solvent is because it's polar. Being a polar molecule, like dissolves like. That's a term that you should know. Like dissolves like. The reason why you should know that term is because if the solute is similar to the solvent, it will dissolve in it. So polar molecules will dissolve in water because they're polar. An extreme case of polarity is ionic. Ionic is not an unequal distribution of electrons. It's a complete exchanging of electrons. So basically, an ionic compound it is an extremely polar uh, bond. An ionic bond is an extremely polar bond. One of the things that I wanted to point out is re the reason why hydro or water is such an abundant compound is it has a really high boiling point for having such a low molecular weight. The reason why it has such a high boiling point is because it's polar, it has partial positive and negative charges. So we see here that the oxygen has a partial negative charge and the hydrogens have partial positive charges. Those partial charges make the water molecules attracted to each other and keeps it together. That's why it has such a high boiling point and we find it abundantly in nature in a liquid form. We'll also see that this polar characteristic partially negative and partially positive charges is another reason why it's so good at dissolving salts. Concentration of ions. So when soluble ionic compounds are added to water, they separate, they dissociate. Soluble ionic dissociate because the solvent to solute attraction is greater than the solute solute attraction. What exactly does that mean? When I throw sodium chloride in solution, the water molecule is actually stronger attracted to the individual ions than the ions to each other. So the solute to solute attraction between the cation and the anion aren't as strong as the attraction that the solvent has for these ions. So in a lot of books, you'll see a picture of an ionic compound. Your ionic compound is this crystal lattice structure. It's basically a repeating pattern. When you throw it in water, you typically see pictures of little spheres dissolved in the water. 
So again, the larger spheres are demonstrative of the anions, and the smaller spheres are demonstrative of the cations. But they're basically showing a complete dissociation of the salt and it's separate and evenly distributed in solution. What you really need to realize is the reason why it separates is water is greatly attracted to it. Going back to that solvent solute attraction is greater than the solute solute attraction. The water particles are basically moving around and when they collide with the ionic compound or the salt crystal, they essentially come in and dislodge individual ions one at a time. They form what is called a hydrated or essentially a solvated ion. What do I mean by solvated is the ions are surrounded by the solvent. So here on this particular example, we see that the chloride ion, which is negatively charged, is surrounded by the partially positive hydrogens. We see that the positively charged cation is surrounded by the negatively charged or partially negatively charged oxygens. So we see that that attraction is, stabilizes those charges in solution. So one of the things you gotta get comfortable in doing is writing out equations for solution formation. Essentially, you're writing out how salts will dissociate in solution. We've already seen this when we've written out complete ionic and net ionic equations. So here's an example. If I take sodium chloride and I throw it in water, it's gonna separate into its respective ions. So per sodium chloride formula unit, there's one sodium ion and one chloride ion. I'd prefer to think of everything in terms of moles. One mole of sodium chloride, once thrown in water, would dissociate to give me one mole of sodium ions and one mole of chloride ions. Why do I want you to think in terms of moles? Because as we discussed in the past, subscripts represent mole ratios inside formulas. So if I was to take a sodium phosphate salt and throw that in water. Now I would get three sodium ions and one phosphate ion. Why? There's a three to one mole ratio. So one mole of sodium phosphate would give me three moles of sodium ions and one mole of phosphate ions. I hope that helps you understand some of the basic concepts of solutions and the two components of solutes and solvents, and I'll see you next time.